what we're going to discuss in this roundtable discussion. It's going to be extremely valuable for the trading community. This is how we try to keep the flow of these events going, just delivering value to the trading community, and that this is going to be no different. I want you guys to imagine that you've kind of stumbled into the back of a restaurant, into the back room, and there's some guys, some kind of traders that have been around the block a little bit, all discussing, talking shop, talking trading, and you get to listen in. And we're going to go through some really important topics. We've got Dr. Brett Steenberger, who's, in my opinion, one of the, the leading, world's leading trading psychologists. Uh, he's an author of a couple of books. I'm going to let you introduce yourself in just a moment, um, Brett, but insanely valuable guy to have in this discussion, uh, just a talent beyond belief. We've got Anthony Chung, who's the best fundamental analyst that I know, and uh, you know he's a real great guy. He's been to our, uh, he's been on one of our events before. Um, you guys that came to the vault in London, I did with Mike and and the other guys. Anthony was there providing lots of value, and uh, I'll let him introduce himself briefly in just a sec. And of course, we've got Mike Bellafiore, who's just too good to even sh like show up. He's just so good. <laughs> he's just not even going to even like bring his camera. It's not even worth it. His name's there. That's enough. He was here in spirit. Um, I'm going to see but, if I can make him a presenter. That might that might work better for him. That'd be cool. So, um, Dr. Brett Steenberger, do you just want to give us a quick introduction about what you do and how you spend most of your days in the trading world? Uh, how, how do I spend most of my days in the trading world? Uh, digging out of holes, usually. No, um, uh, I, I'm a psychologist. Uh, I teach at a medical school in Syracuse, New York, and my main work is as a performance coach for traders and portfolio managers at hedge funds, proprietary trading firms, asset management firms, and so forth. But I'm really helping people with their performance. Uh, I trade uh, stock indexes myself and have done so, oh wow, I'm gonna date myself, since the late 1970s. Wow. So yes, yeah, so I've been uh, interested in markets, following markets for quite a while and uh, love uh, trading and love working with traders. Amazing. Excellent. And it's great to have you here. So, uh, Anthony, tell us a little bit about what you, how you spend your time. Yeah, well, I was supposed to have a day off yesterday, but I think when you're involved in markets, it's always quite hard to, to distance yourself, especially nowadays. I think that buying an Apple Watch was the worst idea in the world. <laughs> now, I, now I shake down the street half the time. But um, the yeah, I mean, I my, my background is um, as a kind of macro strategist analyst however you want to give it the title but uh my career started back in 2006 i worked on kind of like a global macro cross asset um desk where we were covering uh, basically scheduled things that were going on in the market so things like right now if 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 pfizer or moderna come out with some news so i'm supposed to be the guy that can tell you everything about uh, how much it costs, when it's going to be distributed, what the infrastructure is like of that firm, and all these types of things. The ability then to be able to, um, I guess, interpret news flow is kind of my area of expertise and, and try to help traders understand what otherwise is a very noisy environment, typically for people who don't have too much in the way of a structured approach to these sorts of things. Uh, it can be very... Uh, intimidating, I guess, when you kind of maybe if you learn self-trading and you branch off of technicals and start entering the world of macro fundamentals, it's, you know, where do you start, things like that. So I kind of spend nearly all of my time helping traders in that area. Um, I used to just do it for clients. And now since I joined Amplify Trading, which is where I work now the last few years, uh, I'm in more to, to helping assist and, and teach on that side of things. Um, I also lecture at a number of universities uh, across the UK in this area, uh, try and help. Y young people I meet are incredibly intelligent, way more intelligent than I could ever hope to be that I meet at university. But the the problem that they have is they don't have any actual practical understanding of how this stuff that they're learning really mm -hmm. applies in the real world sense. So I'm there. they bring me in basically as the um, market practitioner to try and give them a little flavor for that. Um, and, and especially like real world stuff that they get challenged on when they're looking to pursue careers. 
that otherwise they they really are not very good at because <laughs> they're too busy deep into the theory stuff. So yeah, my background. Amazing. So look, thanks for both coming on to the discussion. I think Mike's just having a little bit of a trouble with his mic. I'm going to uh, the other guy in the room is Darren Oglesby, and he's our he's a, he's he's one of our guys. He's uh, he's going to be moderating this discussion because I've spoke way too much. So I'm going to hand over to Darren, who's going to kind of kick off the discussion here. And if you guys any questions you want to join in, um, feel free to. I'm going to try and get Mike in as well. So um, let's go. I'll hand it over to you, Darren. Sounds good. Yeah. So guys, I just wanted to kind of provide a framework for the discussion because what what we had is an internal discussion within our team a couple of weeks ago. And we were kind of taking this time to reflect and look back at what 2020 has been and, and all the events that have happened. And obviously nobody was prepared for what was going to happen. Um, I don't think anybody at this time last year was structuring their positions and basing their trading plan on the idea that we're going to have this uh, unknown virus, you know, come around and cause mass casualties and global economic uh, shutdown and, so nobody was really prepared for that. But even so, what we found is that there were kind of two narratives or two stories that have come about this year. And one is a story of uh, destruction and despair of financial loss. And the other is a story of opportunity, of record growth. Um, and what we've tried to do is kind of look at those the people that are in those two categories and identify, you know, what was it about those people that you know, for 2020, it's been a record year. Um, they've seen record growth and they, they've been able to capitalize on the opportunity. What is about those people that allowed them to be adaptable under pressure, um, that allowed them to kind of make the necessary changes required to be successful in this type of environment? And so what we wanted to do was bring you guys on because you each offer a very unique and valuable perspective on those types of issues. Um, and so, Brett, I might start with you uh, with this question. Um, I think you probably agree that under quote unquote normal circumstances, uh, trading psychology, managing your emotions, is a difficult thing to do. I know Akil talked in his session earlier this morning about how it's probably the most difficult challenge that traders are going to have to overcome. Um, but then you add on to that this global pandemic, uh, the pressure of economic shutdown and, and all these different things that have kind of come about in, in 2020. What do you see as kind of the, the primary challenge that people have had to overcome? And do you see that that's really any different from the normal challenges that a trader might uh, encounter? If you want to learn three more real world setups that our traders use, including the simple setup that we teach all of our new traders and the setup that turned one of our traders into a seven figure big money earner, check out the free webinar that we're currently running. Just go ahead and click the link that should be appearing now at the top right hand corner of your screen. That will open up the free registration page in a new window. So don't worry, you won't lose this video. You can also visit tradingworkshop.com to register for this free intensive workshop. You're going to learn more in a couple of hours from this trading workshop than from years of online education. Yeah, so the number one challenge for 2020, 2020 is not a typical year, obviously. And you know, you mentioned about the pandemic and uh, people who have succeeded in the environment of 2020. Well, the real problem is that 2020 has not been an environment. 2020 has been multiple environments. And it's the people who have been able to switch gears, who have been able to recognize shifts in those environments that have succeeded. And that, that is partially an issue of trading psychology, but not entirely. Uh, we have to recognize different types of markets and market conditions. So if we just start with equities, you know, early in 2020, we were grinding up in a low VIX market and we uh, hit a peak in uh, January. And then all of a sudden we start to make some new lows uh, in um, February and boom, you know, the wheels came off the bus and volatility exploded, but also liquidity really dried up in a number of markets. And so that completely changed the trading environment for a number of people. And then off the March lows, we got a bounce. And what was everyone saying? Double dip, we're waiting for it to test the lows, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it never did. <laughs> and so we went into this uh, rising market where certain sectors in the equity market were strong, like tech uh, and some of the 
stocks benefiting from a uh, companies benefiting from a pandemic and then other sectors were relatively weak like some of the value stocks the uh, small caps lagged but then more recently as we have had the prospect of a vaccine on the horizon, the rally has broadened out significantly. We see small caps performing very well. Those value names have, have done quite well. And so the whole rally has broadened, creating a totally different environment. So we went from a strong rotational environment to what is now actually a momentum and trending market. And recognizing those shifts which means psychologically having an open mind, not getting caught up in one scenario ends up being super important. Right. Absolutely. And, and that's kind of what we do. I know back in um, it was early April, I think we held an event. And what we noticed at that time is like that was like kind of the height of. I guess it, it was really, it ended up being the lows, but it was the height of the fear and the uncertainty. And what we were telling people was, hey, be calm. You know, we've seen these, we haven't seen this specific, you know, scenario on play, but the, the type of fear and panic and, you know, emotion that was tied up, we've seen that before. So the idea was, hey, stay calm, uh, you know, be focused because there is a lot of opportunity that awaits here. Um, unfortunately, for a lot of people, I think, that message was too little too late because they didn't have, like you said, the skill set to be able to see the writing on the wall, to see the signals that the market was providing, and then to kind of be able to put themselves in a position to to take advantage of that. Um, I kind of shifted over to Anthony. I know um, you deal a lot on the fundamental side and looking at those types of things. Um, I would expect that even the best fundamental analyst was caught off guard by the stuff that we saw this year. I mean, we got oil went negative. Like the brokers had to change the way they operate, right? And so, you know, what what did you see, you know, in the early days of the pandemic? And then, you know, kind of from a fundamental analyst point of view, how did you have to shift and adapt to to be able to operate in this new realm? Yeah, I, th I think one of the things that actually was quite reminiscent of the financial crisis when that was unfolding that I remember very specifically for another job that I was doing. So my, my job was to, you know, real time surveillance of markets with a microphone broadcasting to all traders to let them know what's going on. Now, I remember there's periods during that where there was no news, there was no catalyst, it was just almost behavioral, it got to a tipping point where the selling took over the mentality set in, and the market was just going down. And I remember at the time, my, my boss used to say to me, get on the mic and I'd be like, and say what? I'm looking at the terminals and I can't see anything. And he'd say, say something. And I'd say, say what? He said, just speak. <laughs> and then I used to come on. And actually during those periods of extreme uncertainty and fear, uh, it's almost like my job uh, was to come on a microphone on a Tannoy system and to all these traders and just be a voice of calmness mm -hmm. to instill a more rational approach to what they're doing because you know anyone who traded then and there were bouts of this to a certain degree when the march sell-off was happening you see these big waves of selling come in when you're looking at it in kind of real time in in, in the intraday environment uh, and so yeah a lot of it is yeah definitely obviously experience is a fine thing having seen that before live seeing it again you kind of feel a little bit more naturally composed mm -hmm. to be able to interpret that the other thing that I find that's more relevant, particularly in the recovery, is uh, I think Brett hit a really good point, which is like not being too married to one idea and that the situation, the environment changes. Um, and you know that's a difficult thing because when you're trading, obviously you're, you're making a decision and mm -hmm. you're getting a tangible result on the back of your decision-making process. So you're either going to be right or wrong right. ultimately. And that adjustment process obviously takes a lot of time. But for me, then interpreting news, what's been quite difficult here for people, a lot of people, I think, is there's a big disconnect, obviously, between uh, Wall Street and Main Street. Mm. Uh, and that's difficult when you're subjected to such media, when all you hear about is the, like in America at the moment, you know, as far as the UK, are, we're concerned, you guys are being ravaged nationally. <laughs> and every state's going into a large degree of restrictions being enforced. And yet we hit 30K in the Dow uh, kind of yesterday. So um, I think a lot of people find it hard to uh, kind of pick what 
is the most influencing factor at that moment in time. Uh, and I think the, yesterday was a really good case in point where you have a, a simultaneous string of catalysts, whether it's Janet Yellen being the Treasury Secretary or Biden's getting the nod now for the presidency, whatever it might be. Then you get technical breaches of key long term levels. And you, there is no other thing you need to do than just follow the trend. And I think sometimes people can overthink it to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there, there, there's definitely yeah, a couple of comparatives, I'd say, to, to what I'd seen working on the desk from, from 2008, 2009. Yeah, if I could just jump in here, uh, you know, it, it, you're making great points, Anthony. In one sense, what happened with COVID is completely different from the 2008 situation because there we had a, a fundamental situation with housing, with banks, and um, you could see the banking sector, you can see the housing sector unravel even before the big market decline. So there's a real fundamental basis. Here, this was like war breaking out. The, the uh, COVID hitting uh, was not uh, created by central bank policy or anything of the sort. What people underestimated on a fundamental basis, I think, Anthony, and, and I include myself here is underestimating, was the power of the central bank reaction function and the mm. power of the fiscal stimulus mm -hmm. to turn the situation around. Uh, I mean, they really came out with a couple of bazookas you know, when we hit that those lows in the March-April period. And looking back on it, uh, that was an important turning point of a fundamental nature. Those of us just looking at charts you know, really miss that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we no. had the UK government's come out today with the spending review, and we get to see the government level of what they're predicting for their their, their bond sales uh, issuance for the forthcoming period, and it's it's more than double of the financial crisis. So you're absolutely right. In context, this is multi-trillion dollars comparative to singular trillion, mm -hmm. and the, the response has been epic in terms of uh, this time round. Certainly, that's for sure. Totally agree. Now, what the long-term implications of that will be, uh, you know, uh, hard to know. You know. And a lot of the portfolio managers I work with, they're monitoring inflation gauges. They're looking at uh, how steep uh, the uh, yield curve might be. They're looking at inflation break-evens, five-year, five-year forward, you know, to try to get a sense of when we're pricing in uh, increasing inflation. So far, not so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I see we got, I think Mike is on. Mike, are, is your audio working for you now? I'm here. Oh, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for being here. You bet. Thanks, Darren. I just, Thanks, Jason. I just, just to kind of fill you in, um, I was talking to the guys. Um, you know, we, as traders, we usually take this time towards the end of the year to kind of review the things that have happened, the decisions that we've made, kind of try to prepare for what's coming in the year ahead. Um, and what we really saw to this year was kind of two different storylines where we had people who were just victims of circumstance and then people that were victorious over the circumstance. And so we're kind of talking about the, the, the qualities and the things that separate the people who managed to make this a, a record year, a, a, a year of taking advantage of opportunity versus those that were just kind of steamrolled by it. And what I'd be interested to hear from you, since you, ha you have, you know, kind of the, the Wall Street prop firm uh, perspective on this is, what kind of challenges did you guys see going into that March, April time frame? And, and what were the discussions that you were having with your traders in terms of, you know, this being more an opportunity than a, a time to be, you know, fearful and, and panic? Yeah, so we certainly weren't fearful or panicked. We were cognizant of the uh, once in a generation opportunity. I've been mm -hmm. trading since 1997. Mm -hmm. And this is the best trading market that I've ever seen. This is yeah. better than uh, 2008. This is better than the late 90s. Um, and probably by uh, significant multiples. So we recognize that. And w one of the things that uh, is, is perhaps challenging for prop traders, I'll just share a story from yesterday so and look these are challenging times and and so i i say them 
with with sensitivity, understanding that not everybody has had as much opportunity as we have uh, this year. This has been a tremendous year. As a firm, we've done uh, better than we probably ever thought we would do. Traders did better than I'm sure they ever thought they would do. Uh, these are life changing years um, in terms of profitability for these guys. It, it's both rewarding to see that, but we are cognizant of what's really going on. Sure. Um, but our job is is to do as well as we can as traders. And yesterday, um, one of our traders hit me up in a G chat, and you know said, "Oh, I to the effect of, oh, I I blew it this morning." And I have this leaderboard where I check everybody's P and L. I hadn't actually noticed this this trader had been doing particularly poorly. So I rechecked the leaderboard, started at the bottom and figured he'd be down for this trader hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I look at the bottom of the leaderboard, I don't find him and I go up to the line that demarcates positive from negative and I still don't find him. And then he chats me up again and he says, I made 200, I should have made four to 500,000. And, you know, so for the elite traders, one of the things that they have to fight with is you know making sure that they make the most of the opportunities making sure if they leave a couple of bucks on the table you know the trader felt like he left to three hundred thousand dollars yesterday morning on the table and he did for his skill level mm -hmm. that you know they remain focused they don't over trade they don't try and make it back they don't get themselves into trouble that uh they they get to that place where they're focused and so for us, we we are seizing the opportunity. The challenge is to be focused, to be open-minded, not to come in. It's very easy to come in and say, oh, uh, the electric vehicle space is so overbought, we should be shorting these. Um, you want to be you want to be open-minded. Oh, the marijuana sector is so overbought, we should be shorting this. Oh, how can the market possibly rebound? We're going to have a second wave, and we, we're going to go test the, loon, the new lows. So you know, volatility is at levels that are not sustainable over the, uh, over the short period. We, we should short that. So we, we want to be focused and open-minded uh, and, and, and recognize the opportunity. And when we see the opportunity, we want to attack. Mm -hmm. and attack the moment for what it is because we're not going to get it again for a very long period of time. We're not going to trade a market like this again, uh, probably, I'm not sure when. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting our traders and Dr. Steenbarger helps our top traders and, and all of our traders with this immensely. It's being focused, it's being mm -hmm. prepared, it's being opportunistic, it's being ready to attack when we see it mm -hmm. and being open-minded. Yeah, and I, I think you make a good point about being prepared because that's something that we've tried to hammer into to our clients. And as educators, it's it's really like um, it, it's either you're in a in a place where you can take advantage of opportunities when they present because it most likely we're not going to experience markets like we've seen over the last six months again anytime soon. But what we have noticed is you mentioned 2008. Uh, 2009, 2010 timeframe, those presented some really big opportunities. And the way that our economy is operating right now, where everything is so interconnected, um, I feel like maybe I'm off base, but maybe you guys can can expand on it. I feel like we're going to continue to see major moves in, in kind of a similar aspect. Um, with the type of government stimulus that we've been seeing, not only in, in Europe, but here in the States, um, you know, we've spent more with this year than in U.S. history combined, like in, and they're talking about another couple trillion dollar plan coming out. Um, I feel like the volatility isn't going to go away anytime soon. Um, and so what we're trying to impress upon people is that they begin to work on those skills and develop a plan, be confident in their ability to analyze a market and and to make those adaptations. That way, when the opportunities do present, that they'll be in a position to take advantage of that. Um, what I think is probably difficult um, is being able to stay calm in the midst of all of that and not just kind of sit it out and wait. And so, uh, doctor, I might ask you, what, what advice would you give to people um, when they're in the midst of that chaos, when they're seeing the market do things that they've never seen before? 
Um, how do how do you try to control yourself and stay calm in that? Well, there's an old saying, if you can keep your wits about you when everyone else is losing theirs, perhaps you're not aware of the situation. Um, and so, you know, there, there are occasions where you see something that's unprecedented, whether it's the uh, a drawing up of liquidity during this recent drop or, or just extreme volatility. If it's something you haven't seen before, how are you prepared in your learning and your experience to profit from it? Well, you're not. <laughs> That's what makes unique situations unique. And just because there's movement doesn't mean there's opportunity. Movement is only opportunity if we understand what the F is going on, right? And there are times where we might not understand what is going on. And so the number one mandate is to protect our capital. Hmm. We, ha we have to stay in the game because eventually we'll make sense of it. If we talk to the right people, look at enough things, eventually the pattern recognition kicks in. We, we will make sense of it. But you don't want to get caught up in the activity to the point where you're trading something you don't understand and where you don't have an edge. Yeah, so sometimes the smartest thing to do is just to sit on your hands. Yeah. Right, exactly, exactly, to sit on your hands. But when you are backing off risk-taking, you want to double down on idea generation. You want to double down on researching and building the ideas that will be the next generation of trades that will make you money. Uh, and so you read and you talk to people and you study, and it's out of all that that the next set of ideas come. Yeah, and just on that, this discussion point has been very uh, relevant for, for quite recent because from a cross-asset class correlation point of view, there's been a bit of a breakdown. So it's, you know, just taking something simply like a normal flight to quality bid, you'd see it's something like gold comparative then to say COVID worries increasing and you're getting a, a different type of reaction now and say the dollar inverse relationship breaking down, these types of things. Sometimes just having the ability to have the self-awareness and the observation being made, you've already had some success in your development to get to the point to observe that actually the tide has turned or the sentiment's shifted. Now's the best time to become a little bit more pragmatic or conservative, reassess. The one thing I always say to a lot of the traders I talk to is the normal pattern will almost or correlation certainly they're they're always in flux but they nearly always return to mean over time it's just identifying then when you're in that change and so it, it's a challenge but i i think a good step for anyone who's in that development phase is just the identification that actually and then staying true to the fact that you've made that observation that's a good observation and then acting upon it uh, is, is a good thing Right. Yeah, Jason, the, the one thing I always admire about you and Akil and Tier 1 is you're consistently putting out to your community that our job is to learn. So our job each day, even when the market is opportunistic, is mostly to get better, is mostly to learn, is mostly to grow. I'll share a quick story about three traders, uh, who, two of whom work at our firm, one of them who works at another firm. These are three guys who all made over $12 million in net trading profits this year, all of them. And what do they do yesterday? That's enough money to live on for your entire life. What did the three of those guys do yesterday after they're having this year? They all got on a separate call together and traded the enormous opportunity in what we call the EV sector that's going on in the States. And what was so awesome is that one of the guys was blown away at how much opportunity one of the traders saw during that day. So one of the traders literally saw a million and a half dollars of opportunity in one trading session in the EV sector. And one of the other guys who made over 12 million, it was like, wow, I, I didn't even think I could 
make that much in a day, got exposed to the possibilities from this other trader. And then the same trader who inspired that other trader learned the setups that he was deploying from one of the guys at our firm and had never made these trades before and is on this call uh, you know hitting away at at this big opportunity and so you know the best traders get to where they are for the most part with very few exceptions because they're always trying to get better and and that is it should never stop and it never does stop for them and one of these they one of these years they're just numbers it used to be those guys thirty thousand dollars in a month was a big month you know now Five hundred thousand dollars in a day is is a good day. We're just moving the zeros, mm -hmm. and you can do that. You can move the zeros, maybe one or two times, if you just keep trying to get better. I think it's and that's a good point. But one thing that we hear from newer traders as they're getting started, um, they really focus on that dollar amount. And something that I've noticed with elite traders is that they kind of look at it as a decimal point. Like at some point. The, the dollar yeah the dollar amount kind of goes away they're not they're not focused on that because when you yeah when you do focus on that that's when the emotions get involved and that's where the fear and, and the panic the, the greed sets in and they start making those stupid decisions or they they go against their plan um and so it, it's happy it, it makes me happy to hear that you're talking about that from from your perspective and it's the same thing that we're saying to new traders that are just starting out is focus on the process focus on you know having a plan sticking to the plan instead of focusing on on the dollar amount the money figure um yeah it's very interesting so let me ask you guys this as we as we kind of go into the end of the year starting to look into next year there's a lot of different things on the horizon i'm seeing headlines this morning about uh, you know british economy shrinks by most in 300 years. I'm seeing something about uh, oil tanker attacked um, in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, we got vaccine information coming out. We got political uh, power that's shifting here in the States. We still have international trade negotiations that are going on and, and that might be changing significantly in the next few months. Um, as we go into next year, what are kind of some of those fundamental aspects or, or keys that you guys are going to be watching um, as big movers for next year? Yeah, if I could jump in here, there's a great comment on the chat about how Darren looks like Conor McGregor. Damn. <laughs> I was dude, actually dude, you're spot on. You're spot on. I, That's awesome. It, That's the most insightful comment I've heard yet today. Um, okay, well, well, Conor McGregor is going to give me a smack down if I don't shut up. So, okay, so, uh, so – yeah, you know. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, what's going to matter going forward? You know, one of the uh, pieces of research that I passed along to traders recently is what happens in the stock market when we have very few names, very few stocks showing distinctive weakness. So, for instance, in my research, I track the number of stocks making three month new highs and three month new lows. I also look at uh, common technical indicators like Bollinger Bands. How many stocks end the day above their upper Bollinger Band or below their lower Bollinger Band? Well, it turns out that one of the best predictors of upside momentum is the absence of weakness among stocks. In other words, if you have very few stocks making fresh three month lows, very few stocks across all indexes that are closing below their lower Bollinger Band, then nothing is weak. And if nothing is weak, where is the economy going to roll over? Yes, you could have war break out. Yes, an asteroid could suddenly, you know, uh, smash uh, <laughs> into, but, but uh, barring that kind of event risk, if no sector is weak, if nothing's rolling over, how is the whole market going to roll over? So it turns out that that's a pretty good predictor of upside momentum. The last uh, several days, last two weeks actually, we have had very few stocks making fresh three month lows, very few stocks closing below their lower Bollinger Band. And so that tends to be predictive of upside momentum 20 plus days out. So one of the things I'm gonna be looking for is 
do we start to see some sector rolling over? Do we start to see some weakness somewhere, somewhere in the world, somewhere within sectors in, in our market? Uh, and that will be a heads up for a possible rolling over of stocks. But until we see that, uh, you know, if, if the Fed's going to be accommodative, if we end up getting some fiscal stimulus, perhaps from the new administration, um, you know, we got a freight train here. Anthony, I can Anthony. I can almost see the your brain spinning <laughs> when he's talking about uh, weakness. And how do you feel about that? Are there things that are weak out there? Are they being artificially held up or do they, they look artificially strong because of yeah, the type yeah. of stimulus we've seen? So, so for me, it's all kind of um, trying to almost reverse engineer it. So as Brett was, was alluding to there, the Fed, the mechanisms of fiscal monetary stimulus, you know, what is the chief reason of how much more will be adopted ultimately comes down to how the virus performs, because the virus will dictate then the stringency of lockdowns, which will then dictate how the economy performs. And then as a net result, the actions that will, necess will need to be taken or at least provided as guidance from the central bank and so on. So for me, like when I look ahead for the period coming forward, um, it's then about, OK, with the virus and the, the market being quite amped up now in recent weeks on the vaccine news is what are the vaccines? What is the legitimacy of them actually getting regulatory approval, not just being effectiveness as a vaccine to be stored, as we've seen with the difficulties of, say, uh, some of them have had uh, with temperatures and things like that, but infrastructure, manufacturing, distribution, phased rollouts in an order of who actually gets it before then a more mass inoculation of a population. For me, this is, when I talk about all this, there's a graph in my head, which is the economy's dipped like this. It's gone up, it's, it's pointing, central banks are pretty confident with the monumental stimulus that the economy is gonna go like this. The shape of that recovery is what we're trading and that shape it changes day to day on the back of, of of these these news flow items that come out so for me is that there's a singular thing that i think is above everything else which is yes there's there's tail risk on a china even with biden flare up and war in the middle east with tensions growing as always between saudi iran things like this but ultimately the the vaccine and the then implementation of rolling out and the timeliness of that through 2021 i think that will be the the, the definitive uh, one of the definitive themes that will guide overall market direction but uh, the thing that was really interesting about this week is of course it's now that trump's kind of gone and if yellen does come in the ground is set for a repeat of almost the type of approach that central banks adopted post financial crisis which is mm. gradual cautious uh, and equities love that environment um that's what history would prove so um i guess uh, what the upside risk to that could be the very quick approval and distribution of a drug and a vaccine then gets um dealt with fairly swiftly um i just think when you actually get into the nuts and bolts of effectiveness and dosage and scalability these types of issues on a on a pharmaceutical level for a vaccine it's 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 a challenge let's put it that way uh we're dealing with something on this sort of global scale so um yeah i mean it sounds all negative but in fact negative is positive mm. <laughs> because of the resulting factors that it leads to which is more stimulus and a more competitive environment in mm. in many in many extents right and Mike Anthony, is, if I could just jump in, uh, you, you, yeah. you make a really good, you make a number of good points. Uh, one of the more popular macro trades has been uh, being long the countries that are coming out of COVID quicker and being short those that are struggling longer with the virus. Uh, and so you're looking for economies that are going to bounce back uh, uh, more quickly. And certainly the ability to effectively roll out vaccines could be part of that equation and could make an interesting relative trade in macro space. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, even with what we know, what we're equipped with already, a Pfizer Moderna shot is 50 bucks, but then something coming out from other firms uh, that we've seen like Astra and Oxford University is, is two to three dollars a shot. So if you're talking about the developed and emerging market world from a, a, a vaccine point of view, 
they're, they're two completely different extremes. And um, oh, but, but Anthony, you know, my favorite single malt scotch is a hell of a lot more than fifty dollars a shot. Yeah, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. Just saying. <laughs> now, Mike, just showing off. Yeah, Mike, is that is that consistent with what you're seeing up there from Wall Street? Is are all eyes on? COVID and the vaccine, is that really what, what the focus is? Or are you guys kind of looking in some other directions as well? So Anthony is a much better expert to lean on for macro ideas uh, going forward. That's, that's, that's certainly something that we don't focus on. We are looking for uh, what we say, you know, our system is to trade the stocks that are in play. Hmm. And so to us, that means we're looking for stocks that have a news catalyst behind them, have some unusual news, or we're looking for stocks to have a, a technical catalyst. Uh, perhaps they're getting ready to break out, perhaps they are overbought, perhaps they're oversold. And we move around to a bunch of those stocks. If the market overall is in play, if volatility is high, then then we will move to trading the overall market but i will be the wall street simpleton here uh and and tell you that is our smb system mm. uh, could i jump in mike uh you know obviously you know we work together with the smb uh, uh traders and one thing i've constantly emphasized is that a big part of the edge among the smb traders is not only knowing how to trade, but knowing what to trade and finding opportunities where there is movement, where there is volatility, where people can make sense of it, uh, moving from one kind of stock to another, sometimes moving to the overall market, knowing what to trade has been absolutely as important to the success of SMB as knowing how to trade. Thank you, much better said than me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, I've had my coffee. I, you know. I, they should just, I should just yield my time going forward <laughs> when we do these these joint events. Well, it's, it's very interesting to get your guys' perspective on it because, like I said, you guys each come from a, a different angle. And obviously, we deal with mostly retail traders or the people that we're working with. But we have seen a lot of them that are making the move towards uh, prop firm and going towards the investment side. And so if, if I was going to ask you guys, if you were going to give some people some advice more from like retail doing individual type investing, um, what, what type of advice would you give them from the experiences that you guys have on how to deal with um, being flexible or being able to adapt and, and see opportunity as it arises? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and then I'll, I'll take my meds and shut up. Um, <laughs> the, just, just say, um, the number one predictor of success in various fields, and this comes from research in psychology, the number one predictor of success is mentoring. Hmm. Learning from experienced people, learning with experienced people. Uh, I teach in a medical school. That's how medical students become physicians, is by studying with actual practicing doctors, seeing how it's done, and doing various rotations, and you learn from example. You learn from role modeling and mentoring. And so the best thing to answer your question that traders can do, independent traders, is join trading communities if they're not joining trading firms and find people to learn with, to learn from, and that will accelerate your learning curve. Oh, well, I love that. That's, <laughs> I think Mike was right. I'll just yield my time to Brett, and he's, he's on a roll. Um, well, you know, I was actually thinking about it this morning because, you know, we always tell our traders that they need to have a plan that they should be back tested and have a clear, you know, if then syntax and that type of thing. Uh, but on the flip side, again, looking at this year, nobody had an if then syntax for COVID. Like you the, there, there has to be room to adapt and and make some changes and then also like you said being open to continuously learning um that's really one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you guys in because having that community having the different perspectives it, it gives you some more insight um it also benefit from the historical perspective um that you guys have um and also like the historical perspective that back testing brings and being able to look at 
How did the market react as a whole when we hit 2008, 2009? What were some of the commonalities between then and now? Um, and ultimately, the idea is being able to take that information and use it moving forward so that when we have some major shifts in the market in, in future months or years, that instead of sitting back and looking at, oh, the things that I wish I would have done, or instead of being just steamrolled by by the changes, they'll actually be able to look at it and kind of make some some predictive analysis and put themselves in a position to to take advantage of that. Um, so I know we're, we're kind of we're kind of running up against the end of our time. I know you guys are all very busy men and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I would like to, we got a lot of people here and a lot of people are going to be watching the recording. Um, so if, if guys want to find out more about what each one of you guys are doing, if they want to follow you, how, how do they, how do they get in contact or follow, learn more? Yeah, I mean, I'll, great. I'll, I'll, yeah Brett, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Jeffy. Yeah. So uh, as I put on the chat, uh, my, uh, blog site is TraderFeed, T-R-A-D-E-R-F-E-E-D, -E -E all one word, TraderFeed.blogspot.com. So old school with that URL. So TraderFeed.blogspot.com. And all my contact information is there. There are also links to the articles for Forbes that I write. There are uh, blog posts on trading psychology. And there's a link to a free blog book that I wrote on the topic of trading and spirituality which wow. is a different topic yeah yeah so uh how do we take the ego out of our trading so that's linked uh on uh the traderfeed.blogspot.com uh site and my email address is there and uh, i welcome any questions people might have awesome perfect thank you anthony how sure. about you how, how can they follow yeah, I mean, the, uh, I guess just incorporating this into Bobby's uh, comment he's just left, which is a lot, I guess, access to learning how to develop fundamentals um, or certainly macro, some of the stuff I talked about. Um, it's not a, a kind of binary fixed thing. Um, you've got to have, uh, it's got to be developed over time. So I do a macro briefing that I put out delayed, but onto um our Amplified Trading YouTube channel. So I put the link in there. But the best thing to do is have a look at those, see then the type of stuff I'm talking about, how I'm isolating certain types of narratives and things like that of what I think will be in focus. And then just leave me a comment. I'll always reply. I'm absolutely happy to help uh, and engage in that way on the channel. No problem at all. Um, you know, with the fundamentals, my only main advice I'd give you is that you've got to have a realistic expectation. I would say... I know a little about a lot, if that makes sense. That allows me then to structure how I can interpret news and things like that. Um, but that's born out of you know, near 15 years experience now. I certainly wasn't like that in the first few years. Uh, you have to kind of, uh, I think of it as little blocks. And right now, let's say Trump presidency or the US-China trade war, they're just little blocks that you accumulate over time. And everyone's a singular episode that you then put in your, your data bank, which is up here, and it equips you better then for the future. And, you know, as long as you can research and understand each of those concepts as they arise at each point in time, you will develop, you know, undoubtedly over time. The main game then is about being consistent to allow yourself that time for that development. Absolutely. Well, well said. And Mike, how about you? How can they, how can they follow up? Learn yeah, more about you wanna... what you guys are doing. If you want to see us mentor some of our prop traders uh, in real time, you can follow us on YouTube where we share videos of us doing that with our traders and uh, learn some of the lessons that we're learning about markets. Awesome. And I'll, I'll share all those links uh, with this video today so that everybody can go and, and learn more about you guys. I know, like I said, we have, we have, I think probably a record number of traders that have come through our program this year and then moved on to prop trading opportunities. Um, and so I know there's a lot of interest in that and I can't think of a better place to, to send them. So uh, like I said, we'll share all those links again, guys, thank you so much for coming in today. I know this was, I mean, this was great for me. I know it was great for everybody else. You guys brought a ton of value uh, to our session. And so I, I wish you guys the best. Um, happy Thanksgiving. 
for those of you here in the States that celebrate that. <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do this again sometime. Hey, go ahead and click our subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos they are producing for you in the trading community. And please take the time to add your feedback in the comment section for what videos you'd like for us to produce next and what you found helpful from this video from all of us at SMB, train and trade well.